Piyush, you want to start? Uh, sure, sir. Dr. Gaurav, you can come in. Yes, yeah. sir. I'm Piyush right. Sir. Yeah, Piyush, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Just a brief introduction about uh, Jabu Surgical School. So this is basically an online platform that has been initiated by Professor V.K. Kapoor, who is initially at Mahatma Gandhi Hospital, Jaipur. This is basically an online platform to impart education to surgical trainees of uh, low and middle income countries uh, from Africa, Nepal and other SAR countries. Uh, in this series, today we have a lecture on management of early breast cancer by an uh, eminent uh, surgeon from SCBJ Lucknow, Dr. Gaurav Agarwal. And to moderate this session, I request Dr. Nitin Kuteta, who is also a surgical oncologist at Mahatma Gandhi Hospital, Jaipur, to kindly moderate and chair this session. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before Dr. Nitin takes over, uh... A few more things about Dr. Gaurav. He is uh, one of the pioneer endocrine surgeons of the country who was instrumental in establishing the Department of Endocrine Surgery at SGPGI. And in addition to other endocrine organs, he has special interest in breast. And Dr. Nitin is uh, one of the senior colleagues in surgical oncology here at Mahatma Gandhi Hospital. Uh, so as Piyush said, we started this uh, because we already do an online program on Saturday morning, 9 to 10, but a lot of colleagues from Africa, they said that they can't attend that because it is early morning for them. So we have started this new initiative and Piyush is um, uh, coordinating the faculty of the school and one of my other former fellows, Dr. Kailash Kodia, who's at Ames, New Delhi currently, is coordinating yeah. the students. So with that, uh, and, and the technical support is provided by another uh, former fellow, from SGPGI, Dr. Avinash Tank, who's currently at uh, Ahmedabad and his team. Dr. Nitin, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir? Am yes, I audible? Sir. Yeah. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, today's topic is early breast cancer. Uh, as we know, the breast cancer is the commonest in the world uh, presently. And uh, as surgeons, we should know about the basics of uh, breast cancer management which includes its diagnosis and the treatment protocols that we follow. Uh, so we have the one of the best uh, speakers today with us, uh, Dr. Agarwal, who is going to tell us, uh, teach us about this topic. So welcome, sir. So shall we start, sir? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Professor Kapoor, and for your opening remarks, Dr. Kondeta. And it's a pleasure for me to be speaking um, on invitation from Professor Kapoor, yes. who, whom I really re um, look up to as a role model for all academic surgeons. Uh, I've learned a lot from you, sir. Thank you for all your mentorship. And I hope uh, me and all your uh, previous colleagues and fellows will live up to your expectations in continuing in with your legacy. So uh, I'll be speaking on an overview of breast cancer management or early breast cancer management. And mostly I'll be restricting myself to management of or surgical management of breast cancer. Uh, as surgeons, I'm sure majority of people who have joined today would be uh, managing breast cancers, which is, as was introduced by, by the moderator, is the commonest cancer affecting women globally, as also in India. And uh, so uh, something which we all do so frequently, so commonly, it makes sense to be aware of, uh, of what is the contemporary uh, best practices in this area and so that we are able to offer the best to our patients and uh, from the from the viewpoint of surgical residents and trainees again it is important that you are aware of all these uh, contemporary facts so that you can okay there is some disturbance a request uh, the audience or the participants can mute their microphones. Okay, when we talk of uh, breast cancer, early breast cancer, it means 
uh, these are cancers belonging to the TNM stages T1 to T2. And if there are any involved lymph nodes, they are adverse and one, which means uh, the T1 or T2 is between sizes or, or up to a size of five centimeters. And if at all there are any lymph nodes in the axilla, they are mobile and not fixed. And of course, there are no metastasis beyond the axilla or the regional metastasis. Also, T3 tumors, which is tumors more than five centimeters in size, but the but without any chest wall or skin involvement and without any axillary lymph nodal or uh, systemic metastasis too are clubbed with this group of early breast cancers. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment of the multimodality uh, treatment of breast cancer. Uh, what we currently subscribe to is the thought that we ought to do the minimal essential surgical treatment for early breast cancers and not the maximal tolerated treatment, which used to be the norm, say, a few decades ago. And uh, as far as surgical treatment of breast cancer is concerned, almost always we have to take care of the primary tumor in the breast as well as the lymph nodes in the axilla. Uh, currently, breast conservation is the desired treatment in majority of early breast cancer patients, of course, not without exception. And mastectomy continues to be contemporary or required in certain group of patients uh, who are either ineligible for breast conservation surgery or, as is the case in our experience, those who are unwilling for breast conservation. And Today, more and more patients are being treated with post neoadjuvant systemic treatment surgery uh, rather than primary surgery. But then there are certain patients or quite a large proportion of patients with early breast cancers where primary surgery, which means surgery is the primary modality of treatment and then the rest of the treatments, the rest of the other components of treatment are done, that too remains relevant or contemporary. So before we embark on any treatment, we it would be best that we define what are our goals of treating that particular patient. Achieving cure is imminently possible in a vast majority of early breast cancer patients. And today, it's important that we just not add years to life, but also add life to years. In other words, preservation of quality of life is of utmost importance and this is because we are we, we do expect a large proportion of patients to be cured and in a way breast cancer has now become a chronic disease and not a universally fatal disease that used to be some decades ago in order to prevent or in order to preserve the quality of life avoidance of morbidity which can arise due to treatment is of utmost importance before any treatment is started, it is critical that we established, establish a foolproof diagnosis of breast cancer. And this is done by use of what we call a triple test, which has three components of thorough history and clinical examination, breast imaging in form of mammography with or without ultrasonography and a percutaneous needle biopsy in the form of a core biopsy, though FNAC2 is being performed. But as much as possible, a core biopsy should be done because you want to know the histological type of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, and also need to ascertain the essential three biomarkers, which are the hormone receptors and the HER2 new NKI67 which help you devise appropriate treatment plan for an individual patient. So as I said, core biopsy is the preferred way of establishing histological diagnosis in certain patients who do not have any palpable tumors or those who may have indiscreet tumor, which is difficult to biopsy. Otherwise, an image-guided percutaneous biopsy, such as by using uh, a VAB, vacuum assisted bi biopsy system, is desirable. But as much as possible, surgical biopsy should be condemned, should be avoided, and 
before we treat, the patient should have an established histological diagnosis based on percutaneous biopsies. Here on, I'll be discussing this whole topic in two different main sections. One is how do we treat surgical, uh, how do we surgically treat the primary tumor in the breast and how we treat the axillary lymph nodes uh, to achieve surgical staging of the nodes and in case there are metastatic nodes to take care of those metast metastatic nodes. Uh, as far as surgical treatment of the breast primary is concerned, conservation is the desired or preferred way, but mastectomy too may be required with or without reconstruction. And when it comes to surgical staging or treatment of axilla, the minimal surgery that we want to do today is a sentinel lymph node biopsy. However, axillary dissection may be required in patients with considerable nodal burden in the axilla. So let's begin with discussing some bit more about the surgical treatment of the breast primary. Now, the treatment of the breast primary is dictated by the clinical stage. When I talk of clinical stage, it includes the information that we derive from breast imaging as well, and not just by clinical examination. Patients who have small T1 or T2 tumors with no skin or chest wall involvement, most often, than, more often than not, they would be offered a primary surgery in form of breast conservation, though there are exceptions in which case mastectomy may be required. Majority of large T2 and N1 patients today, especially those who have triple negative or HER2 new enriched tumors, they would be best treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy and then followed by breast conservation surgery. Patients who have large tumors. Uh, um, and not readily, um, so not readily amenable for breast conservation, they also can be offered breast conservation after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, though quite a few of them would require mastectomy. Uh, conservation is the norm and should, should be the desired goal in majority. And this can be done as a primary surgical treatment, or it may be done after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And use of oncoplastic breast surgical procedures is helping us a lot in achieving good quality breast primary uh, breast conservation treatment, both in the primary setting and in the post neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting. And one critical goal while doing breast conservation surgery is to achieve no ink on tumor or surgically free uh, margins or uninfiltrated margins. Mastectomy is required, as I said earlier, in certain group of patients, and we'll have to discuss that too. So breast conservation treatment is the standard of care for majority of early breast cancer patients. These are patients who have early stage disease and a low risk for local recurrence. And those who do not have any contraindications to radiation therapy, as that is an integral component of breast conservation treatment. Uh, what is done during this treatment is a wide excision of the tumor, wide of the tumor margins or the palpable tumor margins, or at times quadrantectomy. By doing breast conservation surgery, we do not compromise on the survival of the patients, though there are some concerns that there may be higher chances of local recurrence, in breast tumor recurrences or chest wall recurrences, but the overall survival is certainly no worse. In fact, there are evidences today to suggest the overall survival may be better in patients undergoing breast conservation compared to those who undergo mastectomy. So the two essential components of uh, the breast conservation treatment are the surgical treatment of the primary and then radiation to the residual breast or remaining breast. In fact, a third component is a high quality pathological assessment of the tumor margins and achieving negative margins is critical. The breast conservation treatment was established as a valid option for early breast cancer treatment based on numerous very high quality prospective trials. And majority of these trials have now completed more 10 years or even 20 years results. And the 10 year overall survival in all these trials, uh, without exception, were similar whether patients underwent breast conservation treatment or modified radical mastectomy. Though 
quite a few of these trials reported that the local or regional recurrence rates were higher in patients who underwent breast conservation compared to those who underwent mastectomy. Uh, these, this slide shows the results of one of those important trials, the NSCPP B06 trial, and the recently published 20 years report, uh, results have kind of uh, provided us the same result as the original reports, which had suggested that both the disease-free survival, the distant disease-free survival, and overall survival in patients who are underwent breast conservation surgery were identical as those who underwent a total mastectomy. Of course, radiation, well, addition of radiation to lumpectomy or breast conservation uh, provided somewhat better results. Another important trial which established breast conservation treatment was the Milan trial. Yet again, the updated 20-year results are reflective of more or less the same uh, impression that breast conservation treatment did not compromise or did not have any detriment in terms of overall survival in patients undergoing breast conservation. Uh, however, recently, in the last five years or so, we've been talking of how breast conservation can actually improve the survival vis-a-vis -vis mastectomy. There are numerous studies now, including this Danish Breast Cooperative Group population-based study, which have reported that the overall survival in patients who have undergone mes uh, breast conservation is better compared to the overall survival of patients undergoing mastectomy. In the initial years, there were concerns that there are there is selection bias, and perhaps we are not comparing apples to apples. But uh, numerous re uh, recent trials, including some uh, a propensity score matching studies, have reported comparable patients uh, uh, or comparable stage and risk group patients who underwent maximum uh, conservation. They indeed uh, had better survival compared to mastectomy. And these are some of the other observational studies which have shown the same. Just the last week, there's been another study published in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, and this has uh, kind of addressed the, uh, uh, the concern that breast conservation therapy would be associated with higher risk of local regional recurrences. And this particular study from uh, uh, British Columbia, Canada, has reported that the overall survival in patients undergoing breast conservation was better without any additional risk of local regional recurrences in these patients. And this survival benefit was there irrespective of the nodal stage. So whether the patients were node negative or node positive, the patients who underwent breast conservation had better survival and more or less similar uh, local recurrence rates as well. There are just a very few contraindications to breast conservation today. And in our experience, the commonest contraindication is an unwilling patient. For various misconceptions, patients still believe that mastectomy or larger surgery is better surgery. Unfortunately, this is not backed by scientific evidence. But there are certain pathological or patient factors too, which can result, which, which are contraindications to breast conservation. And these are multicentric disease, diffuse microcalcification, indiscreet tumors, extensive introductory component, and contraindications to radiotherapy, such as in patients who have collagen vascular diseases, those who are in first or second trimester or, or they are in the, in, in the, who are pregnant, how do we do breast conservation surgery? Majority of patients undergo what we call a wide local excision. It's not essential to excise a skin anymore, but usually one would incise the uh, right on top of the tumor, excise the tumor without actually looking at it, or in other words, perform a no C surgery. At all times, the surgeon would keep palpating for the margins and the dissection plane would be slightly away, approximately one centimeter beyond the palpable margin. One, uh, one tries to 
do a full thickness excision that is right from the subcutaneous tissue down to the pectoral fascia which is also excised as you can see the bare pectoral muscle here and this is the surgical specimen which is oriented using sutures uh, for the pathologist to assess and here you see a cut section of this specimen and you can see the grayish white uh, tumor right at the core of the of the specimen and uh, surrounded by normal breast parenchyma all around uh, as i said margin assessment is a critical component of breast conservation surgery the tumor or the specimen which is removed may be assessed either using full section histology or only with paraffin section histology where the pathologist would provide you information about whether at least the six margins the superficial and the deep and the four lateral margins the medial lateral superior and inferior margins are free of any tumor if in case any one or more of those margins are found infiltrated those may be reexcised to achieve clear margins however in patients who have extensive invasion or even after multiple uh, reexcisions the margins continue to be positive then we may have to resort to mastectomy and abandon breast conservation one can use frozen section histology and other intraoperative aids for margin assessment such as the spectral or optical assessment using what is called the margin probe however quite a few centers do not utilize any intraoperative aids the very purpose of breast conservation is to besides curing the patient of the of the cancer is to ensure that the patient's uh, body contour is not damaged is not compromised in a, in other words achieving good cosmetic outcomes is important and what is critical is that we while we are operating such patients we do not impair the symmetry and the contour is not distorted and you can see this patient who has undergone breast conservation surgery for a tumor in the upper outer quadrant while undergoing radiation therapy and you can see the radiation markers here has well preserved symmetry and contour of the breast uh oncoplastic surgical procedures are being utilized more and more and they are coming in handy to achieve good quality breast conservation treatment for majority of our patients oncoplastic procedures are a single operation which incorporates the oncologically sound procedure plus a plastic reconstructive procedure to ensure invasion invasion free wide margins yet cosmetically acceptable or appealing outcomes that is achieving good breast contour and symmetry and these are helpful in facilitating breast conservation with patients in patients even with large tumors and yet having good cosmetic outcomes these can be in form of a tissue displacement procedure or tissue replacement procedure a round block tissue displacement oncoplastic procedure is a commonly performed one here in this patient this patient under, has undergone a uh, level 1 or, or round block oncoplastic procedure and you can see we have been able to maintain the breast contour and symmetry very well this is an example of latissimus or mini latissimus dorsi flap which is an example of a uh, volume replacement oncoplastic procedure where after a partial mastectomy or segmental mastectomy one can replace the tissue def deficit by use of a latissimus dorsi or other forms of local flaps there is a myriad of procedures or techniques one can use to achieve good cosmetic outcomes and oncological complete uh, procedure for various quadrants or location of the tumor and more detailed discussion is beyond the scope of this talk this talk neoadjuvant systemic treatment is being used uh, increasingly even for patients who have early stage cancer this used to be the norm for locally advanced cancers but in selected early breast cancer patients such as those who have triple negative cancers or her2 enriched cancers with tumor size more than 2 cm or those who have metastatic lymph nodes at presentation these are appropriate candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and in patients who have her2 enriched cancers dual or at least a single anti her2 targeted therapy as well before surgery 
how does neoadjuvant systemic treatment help it helps by de escalation of the surgical treatment it facilitates breast conservation because you can downsize the tumor and it also facilitates sentinel lymph node biopsy instead of an axillary lymph node dissection because even if the patient had a few metastatic nodes to begin with because of the neoadjuvant systemic treatment those metas metastatic nodes can be rendered non metastatic and we can resort to sentinel node biopsy rather than axillary dissection thus reducing the morbidity of surgery neoadjuvant systemic treatment also provides vital prognostic information because pathological complete response currently is one goal that we are all chasing patients who achieve pathological complete response uh, they uh, fare better they have better survival as compared to those who have residual cancer burden so that again can be achieved by use of neoadjuvant systemic treatment and one can select patients for adjuvant treatment or continuing adjuvant treatment such as patients who have triple negative cancer and have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy but fail to achieve pathological complete response they are uh, served well by use of adjuvant capsaicin similarly her to enrich cancer patients who have received neoadjuvant uh, anti her to treatment but have residual cancer they benefit from use of tdm1 or t um, trastuzumab emtensin uh, in adjuvant setting so patients who have t2 or t3 tumors with no skin or chest wall involvement in other words uh, early operable cancers but they have large tumors or have cn1 disease they would be treated with post neoadjuvant systemic uh, surgery uh post neoadjuvant systemic treatment breast conservation treatment is slightly more uh, uh, uh cumbersome or tricky compared to primary breast conservation treatment and while uh, in in a patient who is planned for neoadjuvant systemic treatment and then breast conservation it makes sense to mark the tumor with a radiopaque marker because in patient in patients who respond very well to neoadjuvant chemotherapy this marker would help us uh, remove the tumor footprint it also helps by uh, uh, targeting or reducing the volume of tissue to be excised post neoadjuvant systemic treatment margin assessment in this setting is also somewhat more tricky compared to patients undergoing primary breast conservation treatment however will there is sufficient data currently which suggests that post nct breast conservation in early operable cancer patients is safe and the concerns that the local recurrence rates would be higher is unfounded in carefully selected patients these patients need intensive follow up after breast conservation surgery and radiotherapy because these procedures both the surgery and radiotherapy can leave quite a bit of fibrosis and scarring uh, which can mimic a recurrent or uh, residual cancer not all palpable or radiologically detected lesions are recurrences in fact less than 5% of all such lesions are actually cancerous yet a high index of suspicion is required but at the same time we have to ensure that we do not scare the patient of a recurrence unless we are reasonably certain about it and one needs to Uh, uh follow these patient with appropriate clinical radiologically radiological means and only exceptionally resort to biopsies this was all relating breast conservation treatment but as i have been saying mastectomy continues to be contemporary because there are patients who would require mastectomy instead of breast conservation these are patients who refuse breast conservation treatment or those who have involved surgical margins uh, while undergoing uh, breast conservation those who have multi centric disease those who have diffuse dcis or recurrence after breast conservation and to some extent patients who have breca mutations and those who have connective tissue disorders because they cannot undergo uh, breast radiation and those who have received radiation to chest wall or the breast uh, previously in all such patients 
a well performed mastectomy is what we should be achieving and and this is an example of a t2n1 disease it's important that we place the incision of mastectomy uh, as well as we can and the ideal placement of incision is horizontal which includes an ellipse of the skin including the breast and the including the nipple areola complex we raise appropriate thickness of flaps and the appropriate thickness is the flap, uh, by by dissecting is achieved by dissecting in the plane between the subcutaneous fat and the larger lobules of breast parenchymal flaps it is important that we do a complete mastectomy which is to remove all gross parenchymal tissue right from the lower border of the, of the clavicle up to the upper chest wall upper, upper abdominal wall and medially from parasternal region right up to the anterior axillary line and we also include uh, the axillary nodes and tissue all together unless we have resorted to a sentinel lymph node biopsy it's important that we achieve a tension free closure with a suction drain in place and this is what will a certain a well healed surgical scar and this is a patient one year in follow up following mastectomy and radiation in certain patients we can do breast conservation this patient with a relatively small breast volume but a large tumor underwent a modified radical mastectomy and reconstruction using a lysosomal dorsi flap you can see this patient has a reasonably good contour or dosis of the breast of course as a secondary procedure she later underwent the construction of the nipperello complex as well and this is the donor site from the back more and more we are now inclined to do conservative mastectomy what do i mean by conservative mastectomy patients where we are able to conserve the breast skin with or without the nipple areola complex when we conserve the nipple areola complex too it is often called the nipple sparing mastectomy or total skin sparing mastectomy and any of these procedures can be done along with breast reconstruction either using a prosthesis or an autologous flap uh, to achieve a uh, reconstructed breast now coming on to surgical staging and treatment of the axillary lymph nodes as i said the minimal axillary surgery today or the desired axillary surgery in majority for staging of axilla is sentinel lymph node biopsy in patients who have metastatic nodes axillary dissection may be required axillary surgery is an essential component of surgical treatment of breast cancer it helps us by providing staging or prognostic information which are helpful in adjuvant treatment planning and also helps the patient by reducing the local regional recurrences or achieving local regional control however it can also add some bit of morbidity to the patient's treatment uh the axillary surgery or surgical management is dictated by the clinical stage once again the clinical nodal stage is not necessarily based on examination findings alone but also in breast and axillary imaging by ultrasound or mammography and patients who have clinically uninvolved nodes no enlarged or suspicious nodes either palpable or seen on on ultrasound and mammogram these patients should best be uh, subjected to sentinel lymph node biopsy either as a primary surgical procedure or post nsct patients who have n1 that is mobile but suspicious or metastatic nodes they can undergo either a primary axillary lymph node dissection or these patients can be subjected to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and if they become ycn0 post neoadjuvant chemotherapy clinically n0 then these patients can undergo post nsct sentinel lymph node biopsy and this is while doing axillary dissection one has to ensure that we do a complete axillary dissection and the definition of complete axillary dissection is to remove minimum of 10 nodes for the pathological assessment by a pathologist unfortunately axillary dissection is associated with some bit of morbidity up to half of all patients undergoing uh, axillary dissection would have some or more form of morbidity this can be seroma or these can be delayed problems such as shoulder 
motion restriction, arm edema, and pain. Uh, even worse is the fact that in approximately two thirds of all patients with TN0, clinically N0 axillary disease stage, two thirds of these axillary lymph node dissections, if they were, these were to be done as, as prophylactic dissection, these are unnecessary because there are no metastatic nodes. So, the answer to this conundrum is performance of this procedure, what we call sentinel lymph node biopsy. Sentinel is a word we use for sentry. Sentry and, and the sentinel lymph node biopsy is nothing but selective biopsy of the sentry node to the axilla. This procedure is based on the orderly lymphatic drainage from the breast. Almost every lymphatic basin has a set of efferent lymphatics which exit that lymphatic basin and go into or drain into uh, a set of nodes in which case they are called the efferent lymphatics. And then again, from those nodes further down, they can be efferent lymphatics. So if we can identify, if somehow we can identify the sentinel node and selectively remove it, we would be able to establish histological proof whether these nodes have metastasis or not, which is reflective of the status of the whole lymphatic basin and not just the sentinel node. So the currently the gold standard procedure is for sentinel lymph node biopsy is use of dual dye, one radioisotope and a blue dye, which are injected uh, at appropriate timings. The radio tracer is injected 12 to 24 hours prior to surgery and the blue dye is injected just prior to making the incision on the axilla or our breast. And these dyes, they are selectively picked up by the lymphatics of the breast and then they are concentrated in the sentinel nodes, the first training set of nodes in the axilla. These nodes can then be detected either visually because they would be blue dis uh, looking or with help of a handheld gamma probe which will pick up the high radioactivity which uh, is injected in, in, in the, the breast tumor. So the central lymph node biopsy is the current standard of care for surgical staging of CN0 axilla. It's an effective method to detect axillary lymph nodal metastasis. Axillary lymph node dissection can then only be reserved for patients who have metastatic sentinel nodes or who harbor metastasis in the sentinel nodes. The rates of local recurrences and overall survival in patients who undergo sentinel node biopsy alone are comparable with patients who have undergone axillary lymph node dissection. The advantages by doing sentinel lymph node biopsies are that it's a highly accurate and reliable procedure for surgical staging of the axilla and spares the patients of axillary dissection and thus the morbidity that can achieve that can occur because of the axillary dissection, the morbidity that I discussed earlier on. There's a huge amount of data now which supports uh, the, the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy. So sent practice of sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, the, represents a paradigm shift in the management of clinically node negative axilla. Conventionally, a prophylactic axillary lymph node dissection used to be performed, which is no longer done. And that procedure has now been replaced by central lymph node biopsy, reserving axillary dissection for patients only, for only such patients who have considerable uh, nodal burden of metastasis. Rest can be spared of the axillary dissection. The word has now moved on. And in fact, even in patients who have few metastatic central lymph nodes, one or two metastatic central lymph nodes, they are believed that they do not, it's not essential to do a completion axillary dissection, unlike some time ago. And this is, this notion is uh, backed by some scientific evidence, though not as high quality as the others, but the current guidelines state in patients who have one or two 
metastatic sentinel nodes and those who have otherwise low risk disease there is no need for completion axillary dissection uh, similar to patients who do not have any metastatic sentinel nodes only patients who have either three or more metastatic nodes or those who have extra nodal spread of the disease in the axilla would then be required to undergo a completion axillary dissection we are now treating quite a few early breast cancer patients with neoadjuvant chemotherapy how do we manage or, or how do we surgically treat the axilla in such patients the conventional approach has been an axillary dissection but the current approach is now sentinel node biopsy and not axillary dissection even after neoadjuvant systemic treatment has been given and if the patient has clinically n0 axilla even after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy and again we can reserve axillary dissection only if there are metastatic sentinel met metastatic sentinel lymph nodes or those who patients who continue to have metastatic axillary lymph nodes even otherwise the staging of post nct axilla using a uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is slightly more complex uh this is because of the fact that the metastatic disease as well as neoadjuvant systemic treatment can result in obliteration of the usual lymphatic channels and they as a result the patients may have uh, alternative channels uh, which are used by the lymphatics or the lymph uh, the, the cancer cells to get to a second and third echelon node rather than getting concentrated in the first echelon or sentinel nodes but in appropriately selected patients who have undergone neoadjuvant chemotherapy the sentinel lymph node biopsy performed even after neoadjuvant chemotherapy is as accurate as it is when it is done primarily and this is backed by numerous trials including one published by us but the three very important large trials or other four of them which establish this uh, uh the fact that post nct sentinel lymph node biopsy can be equally effective are listed here however the false negative rates in such in these trials were high and the identification rates of the sentinel lymph node were, were lower but when these trials utilized dual tracer and removed minimum of 3 sentinel nodes they could achieve false negative rates less than 10% and that is what is the current recommendation that while doing a uh, post nct sentinel lymph node biopsy one should do a uh, a uh, dual dye sentinel lymph node biopsy and should remove a minimum of 3 sentinel nodes or more so that one can achieve acceptable uh, false negative rates and good good enough or good enough uh, lymph node identification rates in patients who had metastatic nodes to begin with and then who have been rendered n0 post nct it makes sense to mark that metastatic node before initiation of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then retrieving that node that marked node at the time when the patient undergoes the final the definitive surgical procedure this is what we call as the focused or targeted axillary dissection there are number of trials which have established that when targeted axillary dissection is combined with sentinel lymph node biopsy it provides better control in the axilla so uh, the role of this is so in summary surgery for breast cancer in early breast cancer is essential part of multimodal treatment one needs to practice protocol based protocol protocols which are evidence based management of breast primary and the axilla breast conservation with or without oncoplastic surgery to achieve wide local excision with negative margins is essential and it has to be coupled with appropriate radiation therapy to the residual breast mastectomy continues to be contemporary patients who require 
who who have large tumors or who may have n1 disease they can be treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then can undergo breast conservation surgery preferably oncoplastic breast conservation surgery similarly in the axilla for achieving surgical staging sentinel lymph node biopsy is the current standard of care however patients who have n1 disease to begin with undergoing primary surgery can undergo axillary lymph node dissection and tho those who have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy can also be subjected to sentinel lymph node biopsy but if patients remain to have metastatic nodes even after neoadjuvant chemotherapy then they would require axillary lymph node dissection so the contemporary approach to to breast cancer surgery is achieving more with less surgery in other words less is more so that is what all i uh, had to share in terms of surgical management of early breast cancer i am sure there will be comments and questions and i'll be very happy to address those nitin dr nitin yes sir thank you professor uh, gaurav agrawal for giving a fine uh, details of early breast cancer uh, assessment triple assessment that is in diagnosis and then coming down on the breast management of breast and the axilla with taking in consideration of neoadjuvant systemic therapy so now uh, the house is now open up for questions i think anybody who wants to i think you can you can start yeah I'll... so uh, as you said uh, dr gorav gral sir that uh, the placement of clips are very important when you are planning breast conservation surgery uh, in these patients when the patients are going for neoadjuvant systemic therapy so can you can you tell us a bit of detail about it yeah so that uh comment was uh, in context of patients who are planned for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then post neoadjuvant chemotherapy breast conservation in a subset of patients roughly about 30 to 40% of patients after good quality neoadjuvant systemic treatment the breast primary may eventually melt away or in other words there'll be no residual tumor remaining to be felt or to be palpated or even to be visualized on breast imaging and in such cases roughly half of them have residual microscopic disease so that's the justification why even in absence of any palpable or radiologically detective detectable disease these patients still require surgical removal of that uh, uh, tumor bed uh, because nothing is palpable the question would then arise that what do you remove if you can't feel anything or you can't see anything on on breast imaging either so in order to achieve that uh, uh, a guidance to the tumor bed one can implant one can insert a small uh, um, radiopaque marker in the tu- into the t- core of the tumor before initiation of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy or after one or two cycles of chemotherapy uh, this marker would then be helpful after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the in in case there's a complete resolution of the tumor that will that marker would guide us to the tumor bed or the uh, the location where the tumors existed to help us excise that tumor bed for pathological assessment at this pathological assessment as i said 50% of the times there would be microscopic residual disease so it's clear critical that we insert a radiopaque clip into the core there is one particular set of patients which who may have patchy response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and not a concentric response and if after a couple of cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy you do a mammogram and you find that the patient has a swiss cheese or patchy response then it makes sense to bracket the tumor using two or more clips which is not insert the clip only to into the cu- into the core of the tumor but also insert a clip each at the two margins so that at the time of eventual uh, curative surgery one can go wide of these clips and remove 
whole of the tumor bearing area yeah so as uh, professor agrawal has said very clearly that the molecular classification of the tumor in the with the the assessment of erpr her2 new and ki67 should be always be done before we uh, plan any protocol of treatment in carcinoma breast cases and especially in triple negative breast cancer and her2 positive patients respond quite well to chemotherapy and the response rate and pathological complete response rate is in the range of 40 to 45 to 60% even so as uh, sir has said that putting an ultra clip that's a 2 to 3 mm uh, radio opaque markers are available in the market which can be put in the tumor primary tumor or around it to finally locate after systemic therapy to remove it what is very important here is that even after every chemotherapy if we plan neoadjuvant systemic therapy if after every chemotherapy patient should be clinically assessed and see the response of the tumor so that if the patient is progressing on treatment then we may have take the have to take the case for surgery earlier rather than completing the protocol of uh, systemic therapy yes sir there is, there is a question from dr sm abu zafar from bangladesh is there any role of pet ct in the pre operative workup sure sir i'll take up that question just in a minute um, i like to make a mention here that as very rightly pointed out by dr kunteta ultra clips or other custom made clips are available unfortunately they are expensive what you can very well utilize is what we have been doing rather than buying and uh, inserting these expensive clips use the leftover liga clips i'm sure all ot's have some leftover liga clips in uh, straighten them these are v clips you straighten them load these clips to the tip of a lumbar puncture needle or the needle of a venflon insert it into the core of the tumor and uh, using the plunger or the or the stillet of the lumbar puncture needle or uh, that of the venflon just push it into the tumor and just stays there and this way you can reduce the cost of treatment or or the evaluation of these patients now coming on to the question raised by dr zafar uh by and large pet scan has little or no role in evaluation of early stage breast cancer my discussion today was restricted to management of early cancers uh and in such cases we do not resort to routine use of metastatic evaluation in any form and that is why pet scans are not usually indicated unless there is any clinical suspicion some history or examination findings either at the time of initial evaluation or during the course of treatment uh, that the patient may be having metastatic disease there is no role for pet scan so, so you said, just said about uh, the uh, breast uh, breast uh, mastectomy along with reconstructions so now mastectomy along with reconstructions there are different uh, there are a lot of techniques are there where we use regional flaps and uh, free flap reconstruction so please elaborate about that sure so breast reconstruction or total breast reconstruction can broadly be achieved in two different ways one is by use of autologous flaps which is using some body tissue these are usually musculoskeletal flaps and the other big group is by use of artificial or prosthetic breasts so prosthetic reconstruction is a relatively more straightforward shorter duration surgical procedure however in the long run it may have numerous uh, adverse outcomes autologous reconstruction to the contrary is more cumbersome more demanding uh, technically demanding but is less is less problematic in the long run and then again when we are talking of autologous reconstructions our majority of reconstructions done by general surgical background breast surgeons or surgical oncologists are done using a pedicle flap uh, for example the transverse rectus abdominis mycotrinus flap or the lismus dorsi flap or certain other flaps but the other option is use of microvascular surgical techniques and doing a free flap mostly using the ret uh, rectus abdominis mycotrinus flap and these are done by microvascular surgeons or plastic reconstructive surgeons 
uh, and then perhaps in terms of cosmetic outcomes the free flap is the best to do but then technically these are demanding and we as general surgical background surgical oncologists or breast surgeons are not trained in these microvascular techniques nowadays icg is also being used to for the yes. sentinel uh, can you uh, just Hello. tell us about that yes uh, thank you for raising that that's a very pertinent uh, question so if you can recollect when i talked about sentinel lymph node biopsy i talked only about the gold standard technique today which is a dual dye technique utilizing uh, a red pharmaceutical and a blue dye uh, the problem with this gold standard technique is that you require radio isotope and it can be used only in centers which have nuclear medicine facilities and you require a handheld gamma probe which is expensive for detection of radio uh, labeled dyes or or those hot nodes an alternative to this is use of fluorescent techniques and in indocyanin green or icg is the commonest use fluorescent dye one can inject this fluorescent and these fluorescent dyes are also lymphophilic they are also selectively picked up by the lymphatics and concent in a preferential way taken to the sentinel nodes uh, and then using a uh, appropriate nir camera near infrared range camera fluorescence detection camera one can detect the fluorescent and uh, lymph node which has concentrated the icg dye uh, we and certain others in centers in our country we have used a lower cost alternative uh, the icg dye itself is expensive and the detection system for the icg the originally uh, marketed one costed more than 1 crore rupees but now there are systems which cost close to about 25 to 30 lakhs but we have been using fluorescein dye instead of icg which is a much cheaper dye fluorescein is a commonly used dye for uh, ocular or or ophthalmic purposes for uh, uh, ocular angiography and for fluorescent uh, studies and all that you require is a blue dye we use a led dye which is blue which provides blue color light and fluorescein fluoresces under this blue dye and we have shown in our studies and there are studies from all in institute and from and jabalpur uh, medical college jabalpur and a few other places which have reported similar lymph node identification rates and efficacy with use of this low cost fluorescein dye directed central lymph node biopsy yeah this is a wonderful technique and uh, we don't need uh, you know uh, expensive instruments to detect sentinel lymph nodes yeah. thank you very much sir uh, so one we, we would like to close at 4 exactly so there is a last question from dr zafar again what is the trick to reduce seroma great again very pertinent question uh, first step is to reduce the use of axillary lymph node dissection and how do you do that select patient for central lymph node biopsy and do central lymph node biopsy instead of lnd in patients who have metastatic nodes if they are candidates for near given chemotherapy give them near given chemotherapy and then do central lymph node biopsy after an ct if they achieve yc n0 stage but in case you have to do axillary lymph node dissection then restrict the dissection to levels 1 and 2 unless there are bulky nodes in level 2 or there are metastatic level 3 nodes there is no need to do dissect the level 3 and then the radiation should be planned in a way that uh, it spares this in, i mean it it is a well performed radiation to the uh, chest wall and and to the intact breast and not essentially irradiating the axilla one can also do axillary reverse mapping to spare the lymphatics which drain the arm and thus they can reduce this this way we can reduce the risk of seroma uh surgical uh, treatment or techniques and attention to appropriate radiation therapy techniques can reduce the seroma rate and arm edema rates considerably 
So, uh, Dr. Nitin, uh, concluding remark, and then we will close. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Agrawal, for uh, uh, teaching us so, so wonderfully about the early breast cancer, its management. I think this will going to uh, help us and uh, help the students to know about management of early breast cancer at their centers to give good outcome to their patients. Thank you very much. Piyush, we can close. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the time, valuable time for the students. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very we much. We had uh, participants from Nepal and Bangladesh, and I think some other countries, I requested them to put their country names, but uh, probably they could not do it. But uh, anyway, we will have the video uh, uploaded on YouTube. We'll be sending you the information. Himanshi will send the information in a day or two. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Piyush, we can close. Yeah.